Uh, I would like to start with our first speaker, Medea Benjamin. There is no way to uh, introduce Medea except as a real fighter for peace, anti-war, for justice. And she's from the United States, and I learned a lot about what she's been doing in her uh, uh, very uh, young uh, uh, years. I don't want to say long years, okay? Uh, uh, Medea is also an author, but she was responsible and uh, behind organizing the uh, a freedom uh, uh, march to uh, Gaza Freedom March. She has been active anti, uh, anti the war uh, on Iraq and in, un, in many other areas, but today she will help us to understand what is the situation in the region these days. Please, Malia. Yeah, yes, great, okay. Thank you, the mic is very hot now after that very, very fiery introduction. And um, yes, fabulous applause for our moderator here. <laughs> so I think it's just um, wonderful that we've heard from so many people around the world. Uh, unfortunate that in every single region we've heard about, it's US bases, US bases, US bases. And certainly in the Middle East, uh, it is very much the same thing. I want to just call out the countries that are hosting U.S. bases, most of them willingly and exactly as Ida said because that supports their repressive governments, and a couple of them because the U.S. has strong-armed them into it. And that is Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, where the U.S. also controls a lot of territory right now, Turkey, Jordan, Iraq, where the U.S. invasion led to uh, the U.S. putting in all of these bases, and I don't know if you remember Remember, at one time there was a big discussion because Congress has to authorize permanent bases, but the administration under Bush kept saying, they're not permanent bases, they're only enduring bases. Um, so we have enduring bases there. And then there are there is Kuwait, very enduring bases, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain. And then let's add into it for uh, extra is Djibouti, uh, right across in Northern Africa. Djibouti, by the way, is a country of less than a million people. Uh, and it not only has a US base where the US drones fly from, but it also has the first foreign base of China, the first foreign base of Japan. It was a French colony, so it's got a French base. Italy has a base there. And now they're in discussions with Russia, uh, Turkey and um, a couple of other places to see if they can have bases there too. Uh, obviously that is big business for this tiny government. In the meantime, a quarter of the people in Djibouti live in absolute poverty and it is a very, very repressive government as you can imagine. In addition to these physical bases on land, there's also floating bases all over the Middle East. There's approximately 16,000 U.S. personnel at sea in uh, more than 40 U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, and other ships uh, that belong to the Fifth Fleet. And there are bases that belong to other countries, but actually the U.S. is using them. And then there are covert bases where there are covert operations that none of us, even the U.S. taxpayers that pay for this, are allowed to know about. Um, so why do we have all of these bases? One is because this uh, region is so rich in oil and gas and other resources. The other is to protect Israel, as our other guests will talk about here, um, to support these repressive governments that the U.S. wants to support, and also to uh, try to uh, strangle Iran. Um, I want to talk mostly about Iran and Saudi Arabia, but as I lead up to that, I just do want to mention two of the largest uh, bases. One is in Bahrain, where the Navy's fifth fleet is, and that means that it is the home uh, to where the U.S. ships are uh, enforcing U.S. interests in the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. 
Uh, it is also, for anybody who didn't follow in the Arab Spring, it's one of the countries where there was an uprising to get rid of their repressive government in 2011. And it was a beautiful, nonviolent my, my, uh, uprising. My partner, Tig, and I uh, had the opportunity to go there and be with the people and see how fascinating, how wonderful it was until the Saudi tanks supported by the U.S. came in and crushed that uprising. And ever since then, uh, people have been suffering terrible from it, uh, but uh, the U.S. has helped to maintain the control of this repressive government uh, by having this large Fifth Fleet base there. Um, the other that I wanted to mention is Qatar, because it is actually the largest U.S. base in the Middle East. It is an air base with about 10,000 U.S. personnel there. It is the nerve center of the U.S. air campaigns in the region from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and according to the U.S. government website, approximately every 10 minutes, there is aircraft taking off or landing uh, in Qatar. Um, what is particularly interesting in Qatar is that you might have followed the recent controversy between Saudi Arabia that decided that it was going to cut off relations with Qatar. Uh, which included imposing a blockade. And uh, Donald Trump, who loves Saudi Arabia, said, you know, go Saudi Arabia, let's get those Qataris. And then somebody must have tapped Donald Trump on the shoulder and said, um, you don't know, but the U.S. has its largest military in the in base in the Middle East right there in Qatar. I think maybe we shouldn't take sides in this one. Uh, anyway, the U.S. has obviously taken sides, and that side is definitely with Saudi Arabia. The U.S. has been supportive of Saudi Arabia since the discovery of oil there back in 1938. And it's not only the United States, it's the entire Western world, our great hypocrisy of saying we're these wonderful democracies, has supported this government in Saudi Arabia since the time of its founding and uh, has ignored the tremendous internal repression, which is not only against women, but also against the uh, minority Shia population, against the 10 million guest workers who are there, many of them treated like indentured servers, servants. It's also a country that doesn't even pretend to have elections, uh, and there's no freedom of speech, no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly. And we see in the most recent case the horrendous uh, murder of the Saudi journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi who was living in the United States working for the very prestigious Washington Post until he was lured into the uh, Turkish consulate and uh, chopped up and it seemed like dissolved with chemicals. I mean, the most brutal murder that you can imagine, which is starting to create a little bit of a dilemma for the Western world um, about how do we justify this relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, I do want to say, though, the bases in Saudi Arabia um, were a particular catalyst for uh, people like Osama bin Laden. And I want us to remember that back at the time of the Gulf War in 1991 uh, was when the U.S. put those bases in there and the Saudi government allowed over 100,000 U.S. troops to enter into Saudi Arabia, the holy land of Mecca and Medina. And uh, at that time, Osama bin Laden denounced the Saudi rulers who allowed the U.S. presence and said the United States has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of places, the Arabian Peninsula, plundering its riches, dictating to its rulers, humiliating its people, terrorizing its neighbors, and turning its bases in the peninsula into a spearhead through which to fight the neighboring Muslim populations. He described it as a turning point in his life when those bases were established, declared jihad against the United States. And there we get to September 11th. Uh, it is also interesting note to note that George Bush quietly closed those US bases in Saudi Arabia. They were then reopened by Barack Obama. Uh, and now, with the very cozy relationship of the Trump administration, uh, they obviously continue. Uh, I mentioned the uh, internal repression in Saudi Arabia, uh, but perhaps the most horrendous thing going on right now is the Saudi bombing of Yemen and the absolute catastrophe that is happening in Yemen today while the world stands by and watches as every 10 minutes a tiny, frail, 
malnourished child is dying from the effects of this war. And I think it is just a, a, a terrible plight on all of us um, as a human population to see this catastrophe as it is happening, knowing that it is human made, knowing that it's being done by bombs sold by the Western countries and not doing anything or not being strong enough to stop our governments. I want to applaud the, the Germans here in the room for getting your government to stop selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. And I would like to see how we can work together more because we are working very hard in the United States to try to stop the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia. We were trying very hard because of what happened in Yemen and now with what's happened to Jamal Khashoggi, we have an added impetus and we're able to shame, shame more members of Congress. Uh, so we would like to work together more with our allies uh, to stop the Western sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia. And then I want to talk about Iran, because uh, while it's very difficult to stop wars once they have started, as we see in over 17 years of war in Afghanistan, thanks to NATO, um, we do have the possibility of stopping a war with Iran. I want to show uh, Iran here and the uh, bases that are actually surrounding Iran like this. You can see that Iran is surrounded on all sides by the, um, the uh, Oman and, and Emirates in the south, Turkey and Israel in the west, Turkmenistan and Kyrgyzstan to the north, Afghanistan and Pakistan to the east. Um, the uh, the uh, Trump administration, when it came in, decided it was going to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, it is good that both uh, China, Russia, the European countries have all decided to stay in the deal. Uh, but when the U.S. pulled out, it wasn't only just pulling out of a deal, it was reinstating the sanctions. And the sanctions, as we know from the case in Iraq, kill people. We saw there 500,000 children killed by the sanctions. How many people in Iran are going to die from the effect of these sanctions? We're glad that the, are, there are other countries around the world that are trying to cushion their countries from the effect of U.S. sanctions, but we know that the dollar rules when it comes to international uh, exchange and that companies all over the world are afraid of uh, go, being on the wrong side of the United States. And so we don't know whether these mechanisms that the Europeans and others are putting in place will be enough to allow the Iranians to keep having trade relationships with other countries. We do know that the U.S. is trying to strangle the Iranian economy and that its goal is not to get Iran back to the table to talk about other negotiations. Its goal is to... Um, make the people so miserable they'll come out on the streets and overthrow the government. And I think the U.S. really doesn't care very much what comes after that. Uh, they really just want to see chaos in Iran because that's what the Israelis would like, that's what the Saudis would like, a divided Iran where people are fighting among themselves and killing each other. Um, so we have an opportunity right now. Oh, and you see, I, I like this slide because it says, Iran wants war. Look how close they put their country to our military bases. Um, and the thing about the bases, though, it is a liability for the United States as well because Iran has said, you attack us, and we have missiles that can reach 35 of your military bases that are surrounding us. So in some ways, uh, what the U.S. has done to sur surround Iran uh, also has a bit of a tempering factor uh, in the case of U.S. wanting to militarily attack. So I want to end with just a couple of things that I think that we could do uh, to come together to try to stop a war with Iran. Uh, those of you who live in the U.S., please join us December 1st when we'll be having a summit uh, bringing hundreds of people together to talk about how we can uh, work to force the United States back into the Iran nuclear deal. And let's remember, can you tell me how many nuclear weapons Iran has? Zero. Let's be clear about that. Can you tell me how nuclear, many nuclear weapons Israel has? The 
It's a secret. That's right. But of course, Netanyahu is the one that is telling the US Congress and the American people, beware of the nuclear weapons of Iran, which at this point is zero. So we also have something I wanted to bring up, which is we are taking a peace delegation to Iran. We have about 50 people from the US already signed up. It's going to be January 10th to 18th, but we would like to have it be an international peace delegation. And so if any of you are interested in joining us, please either see me or Ty Barry over here with Code Pink or go onto our website. Um, we would love to have some of you join us on that peace delegation. It's so important that the Iranian people see that there are people around the world who want to do something about this and stop the next war now. And finally, I want to say that I think we could also do something, even it's symbolic, but an international campaign to do some humanitarian aid to Yemen to show, again, the people in Yemen that we as an international community care about their lives. Thank you so much.